This is Governor Larry Hogan, and I don't always have time to listen to podcasts, but uh, I do enjoy listening to the Maryland Crabs podcast. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. It's time for the Maryland Crams. Yeah, you make it sound like you meant to do that. I had to tell you to push the button to record. Again, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> Welcome to the Maryland Crabs. Over there is Tim. I'm here. What's and, new? Mm, let's see. Well, I think uh, if you have not listened to our cannabis episode, which was a couple episodes again, you might want to go back and listen to that because the cannabis festival was this past weekend. Yep. I did not go. April 22nd. Uh, I did not get a chance to get down there as I had hoped to, um, but I did talk to two friends that were down there and they said it was like a very, very good time and not in the, yeah, let's blaze up time. But I mean, very, very informative. There was a friend of mine that is considering medical marijuana. I have a bunch of people and it's not. And by the way, they're they're like, it's not medical marijuana wink. They're like all legit. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was somebody that's, uh, that has, you know, is going through some cancer treatments that is, is interested in possibly looking and exploring that. She said it was great that there was a, a special Maryland area, which Caroline had told us in the episode, uh, which is going to have the growers, the processors, the dispensers, some vendors and everything else, as well as some representatives of the Cannabis Commission to be able to really help people figure out what how, how to do this. I think with cancer, especially, uh, I remember my grandmother, this was in the early 80s, and I remember you know, she went through chemo, which was just just destroyed her. And um, she did, didn't eat a thing because your, your appetite's gone. I think that's what, especially for cancer, it, uh, marijuana is very helpful because it simulates the appetite. But, um, I, but I know a bunch of people are going through who, who have, have uh, put their applications in because I think you have to apply and everything. Yep. And then we, I guess we have a dispensary coming up here and well now it is yeah it was going to be in ward three which was rondell pinda well, no. Ronda Pindel- no it's Shell. not no it's not it's not in the city see i thought it was no it is not that and that's that's the thing this is there there's a dispensary going in and and i will go on the limb and say it's going in there will be an appeal on this they just had their special so, it's, so it's right at route two and um and west, west street so west right street. where right across from where uh tcs was Right, and right next the, to Papa John's. Third, third, I, Third Eye Comics. Third Eye Comics. Right. Now, it's very weird. That shopping center, Third Eye Comics, is in the county. Yet AutoZone, I think, is like on the other down. end. Or the the other end of that shopping Chinese center food place. is in the city. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, it, it goes right through there. And actually, the building that houses Papa John's and that used to be the uh, tattoo parlor. Right. Is it's not anymore? Huh? It's not a tattoo. Tattoo player. parlor moved out to Baltimore, but oh, yeah. it's it's vacant, and that was supposedly going to be the cannabis thing. So Papa John's, it looks like might be moving, but uh, uh, I wouldn't if I were them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's, that's, laughs> it could be a good, but it's right. It's it's right on the line, but it is in the county. Uh, it is not the city. So it's right up next to Rondell's Ronda Ron, 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 Ronda Pindell Charles Ward. Yeah, Ward Three. So. And she's pitched a fit. She says, "Oh, it's so close to." Monarch. Do you think that's a? But do you think that's obligatory? Well, first of all, she wasn't happy about the Monarch Academy to begin with, and now she's concerned about the. Well, people. she was. She was all bent out of shape about the uh, the guise of having a, a distillery, uh, a small craft distillery down in um, that Shankapin Round Road. That well. takes me off. That was what two years ago. I think that we're going to have a very small distillery, a whiskey distillery, yeah, which sounded really cool, and it was yeah. going to be down there. And I guess... Yeah, they're opening up in Howard County. It's awesome. Yeah, but but <laughs> but, here's the, but it, there was a bunch of... Uh, I think John Astle, I don't want to call him out. I, I think he was one of the ones, but there was a bunch of co-signers to this letter that was written by... Some church. It was. It was. It, you know, primarily backed by the the churches saying that they didn't want. You know, that infuriated me. And it me. gets into the whole syntax thing and everything else. But uh, which which was kind of ridiculous. I mean, it wasn't going to be a. Big, that that takes me off. That was that's illegal. Uh, it was legal for them to be there. They weren't selling out of there. They were just manufacturing there. It was right. kind of a cool. Uh, that really ticked me off. That 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 not not the church because the church is doing what churches do is that they're, right. that they're going to take the morality and kind of apply it to the people around them. It really ticked me off that that the elected officials jumped in on their side to prevent a business from yeah, going to Annapolis. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> I was just thinking about that today. That's so weird. 
I was, I was, I was thinking about that scene in Footloose with uh, John Lithgow and yeah, uh, get out of my head. But uh, yeah, but the dispensary they got their special exception. Uh, the county did rule in favor of them. So what looks like Papa John's might be leaving, and the city slash Rhonda Pendel Charles and probably the churches and the other community organizations will fight that. And I don't think I don't think they have a leg to stand on. I don't think on. so either. But I mean, it's it's legalized. Yeah, she's claiming that it's within a, you know a thousand feet of the 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 you know they're saying Monarch Academy so close. I'm like, well, no, that's way down the street. And then you got to take a left, and you got you know. And plus, there's there's a couple of liquor stores and beer stores within that that zone yes, too, which yes, is the same are. thing. And I, I think the preconception of a dispensary is a little bit off it, it's more like going into and, and this sounds pretty you know like a massage parlor or a little spa treatment type thing you go into a waiting room you sit down you wait for it you go back with a person that's going to help you select whatever marijuana based on your prescription and and everything else and talk with you and there's going to be a consult and and move out of there i mean i think it's uh we've we've, we've got to grow with the times well not, yeah i think they're seeing cheech and chong and jeff spicoli hanging out front smoking and playing dead music and i just uh, i think it's going to be one of those things you don't don't even know that it's there. No, they're not. Especially at this point now, since we don't have recreational use of marijuana. I mean, I, you know, I don't. I don't want anybody to know. You know, I don't want anyone looking at my prescriptions in the drugstore. You know, you go in the drugstore, you get your bag, and 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 you leave. Um, I, I don't think that. I don't think it's going to be like this big hangout place. It's like, oh man, yeah, no, I got I got shelf three B. Check this. You know, I mean, no, it's not going to happen. You know, it's funny though. I think that stigma is still there. Going back to what we were talking about uh, with with the cannabis folks, and we were always talking about my wife. We were talking about something the other night, and she was talking about drug, uh, f- not a friend, but like one of someone she grew up with that she didn't like, and they fell on hard times, and she was glad. But she said something like, "Oh, they're hardcore into drugs." I'm like, "Oh, what do they do?" She's like, "Well, it's it's marijuana." I'm like, "And that's where I kind of snorted." I'm like, "Yeah, but you're lumping." And we'll talk about this when we have Angel Trainer in here in, in a few minutes. But I have a hard time with the marijuana as a drug thing. I don't smoke it. I don't. You know, I, I can't say that I didn't. You know, in the past, but 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 I say, but I think there's still that stigma and. My wife was saying this, by the way, while swirling her glass of wine, which is so much more harmful uh-huh. than marijuana. And so I think there's there's a sea change right now with marijuana. It's happened a lot faster than I thought it would in this country, where I, I think it's becoming quickly becoming socially acceptable. I think 60 some percent of all Americans favor full legalization. So I think maybe for Rhonda, this is something she had to do in principle, like was to oppose that it's going to be there. Right. Um, I think any i think almost any older person i mean the would only, have the had, only one would that's have got an argument there is papa john's because they're pretty much going to be forced out of their building and forced into find another i mean that's a let's face it that's a piece of crap building that's already there the yeah, it's pretty talking awful. about ripping it down and, and rebuilding from scratch so i mean you know papa john's is going to have to find a new place it's going to probably be a little bit more that expensive. whole block is kind of sketchy to be honest well, with you it needs to be re- it needs to be revitalized and everything else and hopefully when they build a new library not too far from down there that uh, oh, I didn't know they're doing that. I thought they're just renovating the one on West Street. Well, they're going to build a new one over at West Street. That's going to close down. Oh, so they're, build, so they're moving the library? No, no, they're it, on West Street, which is not too far from that area. Uh-huh. I'm just saying, when they build that new library at the existing location on West Street, they're going to close the library down, right? Raise it and rebuild. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, and that will be a, um, you know, maybe that'll be a little jump start to help revitalize that section. Yeah, well, I mean the whole place, but I mean I, the, the building looks cool. The conce- I mean, I know that yeah. the, the conceptual drawings always look much cooler right. than it actually ends up being. But right, um, so I, yeah, I don't I, something to follow. Yeah, something to follow. Hey, this this week's episode I'm pretty excited about, and we're going to talk about the heroin epidemic, which has been an overused term. But I don't think it's a wrong term. I, well, I don't think so. I think people kind of, I think after a while, we when you heard about the AIDS epidemic, you kind of tuned out because it was, and I think that's where we are right now with the, the heroin epidemic and the opioid epidemic is that everyone's talking about it and it's in all the papers and it's, it's a campaign uh, prom, a campaign uh, topic every time someone's up for election. But but yeah. it's very serious. It is. And we're, and we're going to talk to Angel Trainer, who is the founder of an organization called Serenity Sistas. She doesn't talk the talk. She walked the walk. Um, she's got a great, not a great, but a, just a, a very fascinating backstory about how everything came to be. And she's got a firsthand insight into the problem that we face, not only here in Annapolis, not only here in Anne Arundel County, not only here in Maryland, uh, but as we face as a nation. And, and she um, understands addiction from, from personal experience. Ab- absolutely. And we're going to be back with Angel Trainer in just a little bit. 
Uh, in the meantime, you want to find us on Facebook. We have a we have a group. We have a page. You can find us on Twitter at MD Pod, MD Crabs Podcast. John's at I Annapolis. I'm at Tim Hamilton forty seven. You can send us emails at info at the Maryland Crabs dot com. Uh, we were also on iTunes. Uh, we're <laughs> Apple changed it. It's just like they changed the little connectors on the phones. It's called Apple Podcasts now. They're the worst. You know, I'm an Apple <laughs> fanboy, and I'm, they're starting to lose me. They just first of all, they're so bloated that I, the music, the iTunes on or the music on your phone. It's just I just want to play a song. And now they they're suggesting songs to buy. Oh yeah, they're, they're starting to tick me yeah. off. But but you can still subscribe to us there at Apple Podcasts and give us a rating. Yeah, uh, and thank you to everybody that has given us a rating. Yeah, everyone's That's... been very generous, except for that one guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. that someone you tick someone off. Yeah, I'm going to assume it's you. I must have pissed him off. Yeah, that's fine. I and have that tendency. So do all those things. Follow us and stay connected with us. And now we are going to be joined by Angel Trainer In just a second. And we are back. Hey, we have a great guest in, I would say a studio, but it's actually a bedroom and a kitchen table. But that's... Uh, Looks like a studio. That, that'll work. And the voice that <laughs> you're, you're hearing, easily impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I am. There, there goes my ego. We have Angel Trainer with us, who is the founder, president, CEO, lead janitor, head poobah, and everything else of an organization that's fabulous in Anne Arundel County called Serenity Sisters. Yes, I am. Uh, you're also the organizer of a nonprofit event which is going to go to help heroin awareness and not awareness but to help uh, raise some funds to battle this problem that we've got yep um, and that's coming up on sunday and we'll get into that a little bit later but what we want to talk about really is a little bit about serenity sisters and how it ties in with the heroin and opioid problem we have here in maryland and Rundle county annapolis you can even get more specific and say it's down on your street um, it, it is it, absolutely it really is. on your street. And it's become what, such almost cliche when you talk about the opioid epidemic that it's almost people are not even hearing it anymore. I know, like, I, I see that it's at crisis levels. It's, it's, uh, it's infesting every element of the, the American culture to the point, and it's been in the last couple of years where it's become to the forefront. But it seems like that this is what, you this think is it's what being tuned out? A little bit. Now, it's, I think I think it's where you have you know we talk. It wasn't until we talked to West uh, Adams, you know, the, the, yeah. a while ago, where it, I really tuned into it. And, you know, I have a family member who was involved in it, but I mean, I'm looking at this map right here. With this, we're looking at a map with the overdoses. It's staggering. It is staggering, and um, you know, for for people to think that it's not in their communities, uh, we have a saying in some of the circles that I run in that you're deni- full of shit. Denial. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we say to them, <laughs> denial is deadly. Because it is. Because if we don't recognize the I thought you were going to go with the, the river in Egypt thing. And I was yeah. going, no. I was going to try not to roll my eyes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'll, I'll tell you, before we really get into the bits and pieces here, one thing, the reason that I wanted to talk to Angel, she's not a talking head. She's not uh, just somebody spewing these facts and figures. Uh, if you need that, you can go to, and no offense to them, but you can go to the Department of Health. They've got all the facts and figures that you possibly want. You can go to the police department and they can give you everything else. But you've been here. You've done that. I have. I have. So not only am I the executive director of Serenity Sisters Incorporated, but I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is I've not found it necessary to use heroin um, in almost 10 years. Now, I can tell you that before September 6, 2007, for the 33 years before that, all bets were off because I was in active addiction for 33 years. So I understand the disease and, and I understand how... You know, a person who is affected by substance use disorders, I understand how they think. Well, I know that that helps me with my job and and in the other things that I do in the county and in the city. Is it safe to say that you hit rock bottom? Mm, I would say I hit rock bottom. Um, you know, my my last six months was pretty horrific. Um, I'm an Annapolitan through and through. You know, did did all of my all of my dirty deeds right here in Anne Arundel County. And and what happened to me in that last six months is I came to a point where I was afraid to live with drugs and I was afraid to live without drugs. And I didn't know what to do and didn't understand, you know, that there was really that there was help available for me. Um, but with that, I also had to be willing to accept the help. Or were you, were you married, have kids? 
Um, so I, well, I believe that everybody should be married at least once. I was married a long time ago. (laughs) So no, at the end, um, I was basically by myself. I do have children. I have a biological son who will be 39 this year. Um, and then I have a couple of foster children that somebody thought it'd be a great idea to give me at one point. But you know, those, those boys are like my children. So, um, yeah, I have three. All right. So, but at the time when you, and I, I know rock bottom is kind of a cliche term, but like when you just hit your moment of re- realization, I mean, did you have that kind of family unit or was pretty much all that disappeared? You, the addiction took over? It was, it was gone. So in, in that 33 years of active addiction, um, you know, I, I got married, I bought a house, I built a very successful business. I had children that I was raising and from the outside, everything looked wonderful. So if you, you know, if a neighbor were to look at my house, it, it was beautiful. My gardens were beautiful. Cars washed, all of that. But through, you so know. So the facade looked great. Oh, on the outside, everything looked wonderful. On the inside, things were not that way. Um, but you would never know it. You know, so I just look like the average PTA mom. So does it take, so, and I've been around addiction a lot. So I've seen, I've seen it up close. So, and what I've seen is that generally it stems from something, you know, that, that obviously there's, there's a catalyst that is not one thing. It's many things and people self-medicate, but does it get to the point that what you're, you're escaping is irrelevant at that point? Because the addiction is just everything at that point that that you're not trying to escape anything. It's just that your body craves what, what you've been feeding it for so long. Absolutely. So for me, it started with the feelings of not feeling good enough, smart enough, fast enough, whatever. Um, and, and before I knew it, before I knew it, the disease had a hold of me and there was there was no stopping. I was I was physically addicted. I was mentally addicted. And there was just it took what it took for me to end that cycle. Were you in denial or was this something th- or th- you didn't think about or was it something that you were that was just killing you, but you couldn't break away from it. For the first 20 years, um, I was in denial. I, I was because my thought was, you everything looks great. Everything is fine. I'm, I was not acting out on criminal behaviors at the time because I made enough money to support my habit. But after that, that last 13 years, things changed drastically. Um, and for me, that was because I, I picked up heroin. Uh, and How does things- it happen? How, I mean, what, what's the it's not something gradual. I mean, what's the moment where you go from what was, what was your drug of choice at the time? It was booze and um, alcohol, cocaine, marijuana. OK, Mm-hmm. So going from there to to th- that leap and that's a pretty big leap. I mean I know it's you know drugs and th- that it's it all bleeds into each other and booze bleeds into uh coke and you know it's a, but what is that moment where you jump into heroin because that's a big moment. For me it was a change in people. Um all of a sudden I found myself, you know, surrounded I surrounded myself um with some people that were using that particular drug. So Looking at the heroin issue that we have now, I can tell you that, you know, 20, 15, 20 years ago, if you were a heroin addict or you used heroin, you were an outlier. And even people in the drug community kind of looked at you like, oh, my God, what are you doing? I see, I see that. I remember in college, crank. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, people, people were doing cocaine and they were doing marijuana. Uh, and there were some people that were doing crank, which I'm not absolutely sure even to this day what it is. But I know my I had, a, I had a roommate that was snorting it and it was uh, just the most horrible looking face he made. It was in pain. Uh, but the people that use that were the, were the outcast even among the people that were using other drugs. Yeah. So it's probably very similar. Yes, absolutely. So I surrounded myself with some people that were using that particular drug. And for me, it was just a natural, oh, Okay, I'll I'll try that. And I can tell you that for myself, even though I was I was an addict before then, right? I was using substances. When I found that particular substance, for me, ev- everything <coughs> aligned. And and that started my last 13 years. And in that last 13 years, I lost the house, the cars, the business. I started acting out on criminal behaviors. I was in and at by that by the end, I had been in and out of jails, in and out of rehabs, and um, first name basis with the cops type. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. My 
my uh, relationship with the Annapolis Police Department is way different today than it was then because they <laughs> you knew got me. Deep, deep roots with the Annapolis <laughs> Police Department. I do, I do, and some of those officers are still um, they're still there, and they just you know today I get hugs from them instead of handcuffs. Let, let's shift shift <laughs> shift gears a little bit here and, and talk about your hugs from the cops and mm-hmm. what you're doing now. Okay, we've gone from rock bottom or your rock bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, I would think that a, a a deadly overdose is the bottom bottom, uh, and the worst thing that any kind of outcome there. But what? Where did Serenity Sisters? And this is S I S T A S. Yes. Uh, there's no need for proper English on this. Uh, where did this? Uh, I'm we'll watching put- him say this, the sisters, and it's it's like watching your parents you know, talking yeah. about Snoop Dogg or something. Yeah. He keeps going sisters. Um, but we'll put a. <laughs> We'll put all the links in the in the show notes and everything else. But what what does Serenity Sisters do? How did it come about? What why did you decide to start this? You had a successful business before you lost it, mm-hmm. and now now you're into into here. You're I, w- I would say a real estate tycoon, but then I'd have to go into like that whole Donald Trump thing. But I mean, you know, you've got five different <laughs> properties. I do. Um, and, and you're doing wonderful things for women in the county. Um, you know, when I when I got clean in September of 2007, I had. I had burned every single bridge that I had. You know, my the people that loved me didn't want me anywhere near them because of, you know, the things that I had done to them, stealing and lying and things like that. And and I really didn't have anywhere to go when I got out of rehab. Um, and I knew that coming towards the end of my Because you're stay. kind of on the razor's edge at that point where you could go, I mean, you could relapse like that. And, Absolutely. And, and, and everyone who's close to you. It's like, well, she's clean now, but, you know. They were on their guard. Right. Absolutely. My, fa- my father's an alcoholic, and he's he's very cognizant of it. He says, you know, you're once, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You are a recovering alcoholic. And, and you said that when we first started, that, you know, you are in recovering addict. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and, it, and it doesn't end. So you're. And my dad has not drank in 15 years, and he still considers himself a recovering alcoholic. But because it couldn't go back. So, but right. I think the the point is coming out is that you, you you've, you've burned all your trust and you've burned, you know all those bridges, so you don't have that safe place to go to. It's- Every bit of it, and and it, you know, at first I was angry, but then I I completely understood. I understood why you know where, what my actions had done. Um, gratefully, I had that one friend left that was willing to um, to give me a chance. Uh, so I moved in with her. But what I became very What I recognized right away is there was nowhere in Annapolis for women to go. Now, we have some other facilities. You know, we've got Chrysalis House, and then there's, you know, the place up in Fort Meade, Sarah's House. But there really was nothing in the city of Annapolis. Um, So, you know, for me in the beginning, it was a dream to start something for women. But I had some other stuff that I had to take care of first, you know. And, And that for me, that was I went to college and, you know, got stable in my own recovery so that I could go and help other women. Um, Serenity Sisters is five years old, so we started in March of 2012. Thank you. Well um, done. And I just wanted, I wanted safe, clean, sober, supportive housing for women to go to. Um, so I've, I've basically grown from, I've basically grown one house per year. And this is a a, a, a woman that may be in a physical or not, but in a, in a true rehab type of a program, whether it be inpatient, I guess, or outpatient, mm-hmm. that they're not capable or not, they don't trust themselves enough to go back into their own homes or into their own neighborhoods at this point. Correct. And then they call up Serenity Sisters and see if they have a, uh, a shared bed or a shared house. So in my houses, depending on the size, um, and you, you mentioned real estate tycoon, I don't own any of them. Um, we're working towards that, but I have great landlords who who back me on my mission, which is a blessing because, you know, we have the right. not in my backyard thing going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm talking to you, Pasadena. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I love them. I'm going to love them anyway. Um, so, you know, I, depending on the size of the house, depends on how many women. So I have, you know, I have a couple of five bedroom houses. Um, in those houses, it's anywhere from nine to 11 women. Uh, you start out in a dorm situation. So the, the master bedroom typically is the dorm for women. And, you know, I say it to them all the time. If you can make it through that phase into a two person room, you're doing something. So why do you really start out in a dorm situation? Um, because I personally believe that 
one of the things that we need to do right away is to start building relationships with people so that we can go back and build relationships with our family. And I mean, in everyday life, don't we don't we have to have relationships with people? Mm-hmm. It's just a part of life. You know, the Probably, world the world was here first, so we need to learn to live and, in and, it. And you've got some support, I imagine, too, as well. If you've got a, you know, if you're in a dorm situation with a, a roommate. Right. They're giving you the support. Well, it's something, from what I understand, it's what you're avoiding when you're coming out of recovery, or you're always in recovery when you come out of, you know, when you're drying out or, or you kick the addiction. I mean, it's all very raw, and it's the people, places, and opportunities. You have to avoid all those things. And, and you know, in a town, an area certainly is, as I mean, we're part of the greater metropolitan area, but, you know, Napa is a small town, so the people mm-hmm. that you used to participate with, with the behaviors, they're still there. The influencers are still there. It's very easy to slide back into that. So I think it becomes, what I've seen, it's becomes very insular in the immediate immediate uh, period of time after uh, you get you get sober is that um, you become insular with the people with whom you, you get sober because they're going through the same thing that you are and they're experiencing the same cravings the same confusion the same guilt the, the same embarrassment the same right everything that goes along with that uh, yeah. that's something that unless you've done it you, you don't understand you know you, you can say I understand unless you go on through addiction you have absolutely no clue just well, like, absolutely. Uh, like, uh, again, that's 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 what's so compelling about your story, Angel, and that you've, you've been there, you've done that, you've you know, you're just not talking the talk, you've walked the walk, and and now now you are talking the talk. Uh, I'm I'm assuming that you don't have nearly enough beds as you need. I always have a waiting list. Always. So I have three female, single female houses. I have one house that is specific for mothers and children. So I house four moms, each with one child. Hmm. And then um, my most recent endeavors in September, I opened up a men's house. And to to apply to one of these, I mean, you you can go to serenitysisters dot com dot com, mm-hmm. and uh, apparently find out how to apply on there. And that's a great website, by the way. Thank you. I love the fonts. Yeah, that's a nerd you. thing, but I, I love the fonts. Oh, then we're nerds together <laughs> yeah. because I pick the fonts. I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you can go to www.serendisisters.com and um, you can find out all about the organization. There's also a tab on there where you can go directly to our guidelines. So I do that for not only for the substance user, but for parents, because I deal with a lot of loved ones who are trying to get their children or their sister's okay, brothers. Okay, so I've got a son in. or a daughter that's that's in recovery that needs something, and I can't have him here. I, I've got a friend in town that's they, they've, they've gotten a son through recovery, and he's living in Florida. Mm-hmm. And he's doing wonderfully in, uh, you know, essentially a halfway house. And they're like, you know, I'm sorry, I don't think you can come back home. Right. And just because you've got such bad influences that are up in at home that Florida is probably the best place for you. Is it, you know, without specifics, I mean, is it is the housing affordable with Serenity Sisters? I mean, is this a, is this an insurance, does insurance reimburse somebody on that? Or no. this is all... No reimbursement for for insurance, so self pay. Okay. Um, my, you know, a lot of us don't have anybody to help us. Thankfully, a lot of my women that come in do have some help from family um, that will get them f- through that first couple of weeks or first month. But I'm a big believer in self supporting to our own contributions. So. Um, you know, my ladies have to go out and get jobs. Right. Um, and, I, you know, I don't just send them out there because some of us come in with criminal records. It may be a little bit harder. So, I, you know, I walk them through the process of um, employment. And certainly it's got to be a lot more affordable than renting a typical apartment or something like that because you are in a dorm situation. I would I would. Th- I mean, I mean, it's, it's a manageable payment. It is. It is. My uh, ladies, um, my ladies pay one hundred and fifty dollars per week. And that covers everything except their food, their food. Mm-hmm. That make that you know that makes sense. I mean, at least so, so you don't have the waterfront twenty five hundred dollars a month. No, no <laughs> type of I thing. don't. They're they're nice houses, but no. So is there any waterfront. structure to the the day within the house? I mean, I know that it, I, I don't want to make the comparison um, because it's it's not connected. But I'm just trying to think about other places where uh, that 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 take people in. And I'm thinking about like the lighthouse is very regimented. Uh, the mm-hmm. lighthouse shelter, as far as you know, the times and and the schedules and what's expected, um, and I know this is a very different situation, but I, I know that for for those who are in recovery, structure is extremely important uh, because addiction is something that just occupies all your thoughts. So you have to keep your mind and, and your your hands occupied at, at all times for for a while. So, what's a typical day in in one of your recovery houses look like? 
So, uh, my ladies and, and my gentlemen, um, they do have guidelines that they have to abide by. So, you know, they have to go to, to self-help groups, um, whether that's whether for them it's um, a religious activity or self-help being 12 steps. Um, they have to attend those. They have chores twice a week that they have to do. They have curfews. Um, you know, they have the mandatory random urinalysis and breathalyzer. Uh, you know, I give them a few days to get acclimated, but then again, I send them out to certain places to look for jobs because that's so important. Um, not only because they have to support themselves, but because people who have, su- who have suffered from substance use disorders need a purpose, right? Because we- they feel useless. Correct. And they feel ashamed and embarrassed. Even, even when you come out of recovery and you're clean, there's a there's a lot of humiliation that goes along with that that you were weak that's why you were addicted a lot of Absolutely. people see you that way a lot of your families do Absolutely you know, that, it is not a moral failing but unfortunately that you know not that stigma is placed You can tell that addiction. people but intellectually they know that but you still you know there's a lot of shame and and embarrassment that goes along with that Right um, and unless you have a support system that a lot of you know families view it that way as well you know I think one of the best things that happened for addiction and this I don't want to sound partisan is when Rush Limbaugh uh, was hooked on opiates you know and he he cleaned it himself up because I think that in a lot of conservative circles you know you had the the, the addiction was something, you know, alcohol was something different. That was just, you know, you drank. And, but, but you know, you, you had the people out on the street, minorities, they were the ones who were hooked on the drugs. And when Rush Limbaugh had his problems with opiates, and I'm, I'm not picking on him, I'm glad, I'm genuinely glad that, that he, he kicked that. Mm-hmm. I think it opened a, a lot of people's eyes to, you know, addiction can happen to anybody, even even a millionaire with, with you know, millions of listeners. But, yes. you know, it, it's not just something that happens to someone in Edgewater or Pasadena or, you know, the, these places where the stigma is that, you know, it's just, it's... People with not a lot of money, and that's their station in life. Right. Uh, let's take a quick break, and um, because I've got some interesting statistics on that from the Anne Arundel County Police Department that I just got this morning. Spring is waiting outside your door, and it's time to make your lawn and garden beautiful again with Homestead Gardens. Their experts will show you how to make a safe lawn for kids and pets using the area's largest selection of organic lawn solutions. Share family fun and satisfaction growing food, flowers, and shrubs together. Visit Homestead Gardens in Davidsonville or Severna Park, Maryland, and go to homesteadgardens.com for deals, events, and workshops. Live life outdoors this season with Homestead Gardens. And we are back with Angel Trainer, who is the president of Serenity President? Chairman uh, the founder, founder, founder executive director, executive is what director my mother likes to say. Of Serenity Sisters.com, <laughs> which is a group of recovery houses or supportive houses. Supportive housing. For women and men now in Anne Arundel County that are battling heroin addiction or opioid addiction or I guess alcohol Uh, or any kind of addiction. I'm across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, And offers a wonderful support to the group. And we were just talking a little bit about how easy it is to slip back off the wagon. I mean, you've heard the, you know, I'm off the wagon if you're for an alcoholic is a big term and everything else. And we were just telling some stories off, Mike, while we were in the break there that you know, we probably would want to share with everybody. But it's just, I think we all agreed that, that once you're an addict and even when you get help in recovery, that it is, you're just always a heartbeat away from, from relapse. Uh, you absolutely are. Um, you know, there are things that, that we have to work towards so that we can stay clean and sober, you know, one day at a time. And I know for me personally to think that I could ever go back and drink successfully would be a disaster for my family. It would be a disaster for Anne Arundel County because I am a menace <laughs> when, you know, when I'm drinking and, and doing those things. So. There's a story and I don't, I, you know, I shared it on Reddit yesterday. The, the question on Reddit was what was the the shortest amount of time you saw someone ruin their life. And I'm going to tell the story because he's, he's dead. So this is not a cheery story. You know that going right in. But uh-huh. uh, when I lived in New Mexico, I, w- I worked in TV news. And there was a weatherman who was there, Bill. And Bill had been there for um, – Bill was 50. Everyone loved Bill. He was, he was very popular as a meteorologist. Everyone loved him. And Bill was a recovering alcoholic. He'd been sober for 25 years. And he'd lost his first wife, and, he, and, you know, and his kids were, had been estranged from him. But he was 50, and he had a wife who was probably in her 30s, and a new kid, uh, a, you know, a new baby. And they put his life back together. And then one day, uh, we had a coworker who was leaving. And so we went out to the bar to say goodbye, and Bill swung by to say goodbye. 
And I don't know what possessed him after 25 years of sobriety, but he took a sip of beer. And when he took that sip of beer, it was like it was like a cartoon that all of a sudden he was grabbing all the drinks and he was just he was, he was chugging them down. And some of them had cigarette butts in it and people were kind of grabbing at him. They were laughing at first, but then all of a sudden it got really scary because I don't think you know, people didn't know that, that he was in, in recovery that for 25 years. So there was a trigger of some sort. Something happened. And then he ran outside, got into his car. And he promptly rear-ended some young girl who was driving. And she was okay, but they sued and lost his job. His wife left, uh, took the kid and left. Um, He couldn't get another job, lost his license. His life just went to absolute hell in literally 10 minutes after 25 years of sobriety. Now, I think he kind of patched it up towards the end there. This was 20 years ago. Um, But but, uh, he went in and out of sobriety after that. He just could never pull it back together. It's probably the extreme, but it's it's a very good highlight to how it can happen. And how fast it can happen. Sure, it can happen within a blink of an eye. You know, well, there's we we're trying to figure out about some of this repeat overdose. And I talked to the police department, and Lieutenant Ryan Frazier, who sent me some information this morning. So when you're hearing this, this information is one week old. So it's very current information. This isn't something historically. But um, from 2014 to 2017, uh, they've had 281 repeat overdose victims uh, in Anne Arundel County. And that's not total victims. That's repeat victims. That's repeat victims. Right. The number of times the repeats have actually overdosed, so this is somebody that may have repeated three or four times, Mm -hmm. is 715 times. The number of victims who have overdosed more than twice is 94, and the number of deceased people that were repeats is 47. And that just tells, that sort of just shows how tough it is to really kick this. It's not easy, but it is easy. And I know that that might sound crazy. I, you know, during the break, we were talking about that final number that you gave, and and my my guess, because I live in this world every single day, is that those people may have had the thought of just one more time. I'm just going to do it one more time, and that that one more time will kill people because their bodies become used to not having the drug. So they they may have accumulated some clean time and then decided to go back into those behaviors and their their bodies just can't handle it. It's incredible. And we're also looking at a map and we'll put this up on the show notes as a thing as far as where the overdoses have happened January 1st through April 18th in the county. 2017 in Anne Arundel County. And not surprisingly, it follows the population centers. Correct. Uh, and that, that would be to be expected in Anne Arundel County or Kansas or California or New York or anywhere. So it looks and like it clusters around the Annapolis Neck Peninsula. You can see that all along Forest Drive and out to Parole. There's We're looking at all these little yellow and red dots. And then right. when you get up to Brooklyn Park and Pasadena, they're just you can't, they're just all on top of each other. It looks like a Surratt pick, pick painting. And surprisingly, Along Broadneck, um, you know, obviously it's that's more suburban, um, but you know, you, you got your dots there. But I mean, it's it's all over the county. Well, one thing that we were talking a little bit before we started, Angel, and I said that when you're talking about the population center, I said down in South County, there's like one. I said, but yeah, there might be 500 people living in that area as opposed to you know 50,000 living in the Glen Burnie area. Right. And the comment you made was that, but that. One person is not buying his heroin or buying whatever he's overdosing on in Harwood. Correct. You know, those people are coming to the populated area, so they're they're coming into the Annapolis area or, you know, up into the Glen Burnie, Baltimore, coming back into the county and doing their drugs there. As, as, a, as an addict, uh, and I, I've never used heroin, Do am I so excited to use that I'm going to I'm going to buy my heroin, stop at the 7-Eleven, and, and use it right then? Absolutely. Absolutely so I'm not, I'm not waiting to get back to my farm in South County to use it. I'm probably stopping at the 7-Eleven with some friends or whatever and going to sit in the back of the car. And I didn't think about that. That's Correct. actually a great point. Yes. So these dots, we were thinking about these as residents. Now, every dot represents a resident that overdosed. But to your point, no. I mean, it just that's maybe this is where they're buying. You know, that, that you could say, well, this is all the clusters are where you can find the heroin, and that, that's where they're ODing for the most part. Absolutely. Or at least because to a, a great extent. They're going in, they're buying, and they're coming back, and they're going into a Burger King bathroom or the back seat of a car in the second you, you hear that all the or, time in a fast food joint. That, mm-hmm. Now, I mean, so that, that pull. Is so strong. It is um, because right. the, you know be. 
you when you when you're going to buy that drug most of the time you know with with an opiate addiction you are physically ill and there's nothing that's going to fix that right there except to use again um and we you know, I can tell you that there were times that I used and I didn't care who saw me. Okay. So you're, you're I mean, I had a knee surgery a couple of years ago and they prescribed me all sorts of crazy things. And I was scared, scared shitless to take them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I can see that. I mean, if, if, if you said you're physically ill, if I am in absolute pain and I go to the pharmacy and he gives me my morphine pill before I get out of the drive through, I'm popping it. Because my pain is so bad. And is that is that an adequate analogy between what's is. happening with the heroin user? It is. Absolutely, it is. Anne Arundel County is doing a okay job. Uh, there's a lot of work to go from what I'm seeing. I'm, again, I'm looking at some statistics that the Anne Arundel County Police Department sent me. And this is as of April 19th, so it's one day more frequent. But so far, total overdoses in the county are trending up considerably over years past. We have 354 overdoses so far year to date. How many? 354. Year to date. So that's the three months? Yes. That's 14 weeks. Wow. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's 25 per week in a county of half a million. Yeah, or half a million. Yeah. Of half a million. Uh, 23 of them are non-fatal, and two and a half of them are fatal. So we're killing two and a half of our neighbors every single week to heroin. Uh, To put it in perspective, in 2014, okay, we had 354 this year to date. All of 2014 had 167. 2015 took a little bit of a dip. We had 112, but it really started to explode in 2016 with a total of 253 overdoses. And we're already 101 overdoses over 2016 with two thirds of the year left to go. Now, what Wes Adams explained to us a few weeks ago, and if you haven't listened to that that episode, that was back in January. And unfortunately, let me interject real quick, because a week after we recorded that with Wes Adams, he lost his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law. brother-in-law. Yeah. And he was very candid about that during the, the, the podcast, mm-hmm. that his brother-in-law was struggling with, with heroin addiction. And so, I mean, uh, so Wes really saw this uh, from up close, and he's someone who's acutely aware of this, rather than just being a political football or a theoretical uh, problem, something that he's seen up close. He seemed very passionate about it. I, and I'm not saying that other uh, attorney generals are not, uh, state's attorneys are not, rather. But um, it's just, I think that when you get that personal experience and you understand what addiction is, because addiction is really difficult to understand effectively unless you've been up close and seen it. And I've seen it. And for anyone who, who kind of sneers or snorts about just, you know, just get sober, it is unbelievable that the power addiction has. So, Absolutely. But what, what Wes Adams had said is that just from our physical geographic location between Baltimore and D.C., that we're taking the brunt of a lot of this, this um, traffic that's coming in with the heroin and, and other drugs, too. Yeah, we absolutely are. Wes Adams is absolutely one of my favorite people. He's a great guy. He is a great guy. And I've gotten a chance to work with him on the Not My Child initiative. Right. um, Along with, you know, a team of fantastic people. And we're going to throw that also, that that video. We'll put that on there, too, because that's a very powerful video to Mm -hmm. watch, too, as well. Um, We'll throw that onto the the show notes with a link to that as well, because I think that's important for everybody to do. Because it will speak again to what we briefly touched on as far as that, okay, well, we may be in the in the population areas but this has really permeated every single street every single neighborhood yeah um, and one thing I've said for a couple of years that I would love to do and there's all sorts of legal ramifications but I would love to see a, a, a community meeting that says oh yeah no no we don't have a problem in Severna Park uh, to be able to send somebody out of that meeting with you know I'm picturing like the time clock going the stopwatch going uh, and being able to actually score some heroin and bring it back and see how long it takes right. Um and, so, but then you've got the whole issue there with, well, okay, so who are you buying it from? Should they be arrested? Should they, you know, I mean, there's legal issues. There's, that there's a lot of that, legal but, issues there. Um, You're right. So you've but, worked with uh, Wes Adams. So it sounds like that just beyond your, your own safe houses that you're you're working with, the Serenity Houses, that uh, you're also working with other government agencies and other organizations? I work with um, I work with a whole bunch of partners in Anne Arundel County, and all of us are just passionate about no new users. That's what we would like to see, no new users. So I, I work with a team of people. I, I 
you know, I'm the coordinator for a couple of coalitions. Um, one is prevention, one is recovery. So I, I kind of span across the, the whole gamut of um, substance use. So how are we doing? I mean, <clears throat> as a group, I, I think this is new to everybody, this, this explosion. And we're just getting, wrapping our mind around the fact that it's an epidemic. Are we just are we playing catch up? Are we just are we just treating the the results? Of what are we doing to to stop the addiction? And what are we doing to curb? I mean, it, that I'd have to ask the police. I'd have to ask uh, West Adams. I'd have to. I mean, there's so many people and elements involved. How are we doing on this? Well, you know, John, you said it that we we do we have a long way to go. We do. Um, however, I I have traveled to some local counties, you know, some local jurisdictions around us, and and what they say all the time is, my God, you guys are in the forefront in Anne Arundel County, and I think being in the thick of it, I don't think about it because I'm busy. I'm always busy doing something, but when I step back and I look at the big picture, Anne Arundel County is we're doing some stuff. Um, I believe that those numbers that you read that, you know, we've come down. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that that's because of the Nalexone and the Narcan, tra- you know, right. the Narcan trainings that we're doing. Now, that's for the people that don't know the, the county, the EMS used to carry that as a typical antidote. But the police officer is typically the first first responder to arrive on scene. And what the county has done is they have outfitted and trained all of the police officers to carry, and I'll mispronounce it, but I call it Naxalone, but Narcan, mm-hmm. Narcan. Um, which is a uh, sniffy thing that they you know inject into your nose. So it's not a, a hypodermic type of a thing. I was thinking um, that Pulp Fiction scene. Which, which, which will counter... No, it's not that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, <laughs> which will counteract the, um, the overdose, um, provided that it's got there in time and, and the victim is not nearly as far. Uh, that is also offered as free training through the County Department of Health. And the fire departments just announced... Uh, I, well, we're going to get into that, but the, the, as far as administering the, the Narcan, the County Department of Health will offer anybody that wants it free training on how to administer it and how to use it, how to recognize the signs. And it can't hurt you. if I mean, if you just happen to be passed out from your Miller Lite thing at the end of the night, I and I give you Narcan, it's not going to hurt you. But if it was on heroin, it would, it would, it would reverse that. You have to buy your own dose of it I don't you get the that. you get the first dose when you take the training. You they give you the first dose, right. um, and and then you go from there. And you would have to buy it. The thing that the thing that the community needs to recognize is that if you're a community member and you give somebody the Narcan, you can't just leave it at that because at some point it will wear off and that the heroin will take over again. So when you when you give that Narcan, you still should call nine one one. That's just triage. Right. Yeah. You still okay. should call 911 okay. um, to get that person the, well, that's, the help um, they need. That's, that's good to know. And, and another thing that we talked about a little bit before you, you came in is somebody had suggested that Narcan is being used by users or being purchased in a, and brought up by users and everything else. Is that um, Alexa? I think Alexa turned on for something. <laughs> uh, She's, let's get that, her mic. That girl. Yeah. <laughs> um, and... You know, is is that true that, I mean, that we could all be sitting around using heroin and right here on the table, there is a dose of Narcan just in case one of us, is that, is that something that you've seen or is that kind of like a stretch? Uh, you know, I work with, I work with newcomers all the time because they come in and I ask them these questions, you know, did you all have, are those, you know, heroin parties out there and you guys just keep it laying around in case. And I've, I've not heard of that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I work pretty closely with brand new people in recovery and they're telling me no. Um, What, What happens in a heroin party? Okay, and, and for lack of, lack, of, lack, of, lack of a term, I mean, they're all sitting there using it. Um, I mean, and, and somebody overdoses. What 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 is the typical reaction? Do you know? Well, um, when you say heroin party, I can oh. tell you that most heroin addicts isolate. They will use either by themselves or maybe with one or two other people in the room. Okay. Um, and that really So it's comes, not like passing a bong around like... Uh, no, no, know? because no, they're social. selfish and they're not going to share their stuff with you because they need it. Okay. Right? Let's be realistic about it. Um, but I can tell you that those those individuals that I talk to, they some of them do come in and they already have been certified to carry the Narcan. Um, and they have it just in case, uh, you know, when... So 80% of heroin users will use with someone else. 80% of overdose victims 
typically are found alone. Wow. So that's, you know, um, that's that's kind of a big deal. But, but we sad. have some but we have some things that have been put into place now. So when you talk about the Good Samaritan law, right, the Good right. Samaritan law, it if you're with somebody and they overdose, you don't have to just leave them because that has happened before. You don't have to do that. You don't have to worry about prosecution. Just make the call. What's going to happen to you? Right. Which which actually was going to bring me into it. And you briefly started it and I shut you down. Again. Um, yep. Uh, yesterday, <laughs> which would have been the 19th, 18th, 19th? No, yesterday. 20th. Oh, it was, it was, 20th. Four, it was 420, it was my friend. It was yes. 420. Uh, yesterday. That's why you can't remember. <laughs> uh, Anne Arundel County launched the first in the state uh, program called Safe Stations, mm-hmm. which is every fire station in Anne Arundel County, as well as the city of Annapolis. Correct. Now is considered a safe zone, safe thing. If you are overdosing, if you've got problems, if you want treatment, if you need treatment, you can go to a fire department and get the medical treatment that you need right there. That is correct. Um, You know, for, for the longest time, Families or or substance users will go into the emergency room and and plead for help. And let's let's be honest about it. Our hospitals are there to help people, yes, but they're not equipped for that type of um, for that type of help. So often, you know, you'll go in, you'll say, "Oh my gosh, I need help," and they'll give you some some resources for, for and arms, send you I mean, on your way. You're right. Um, but with the safe stations, you you can go in, you can ask for that help. They automatically can medically assess you because they're qualified to do that. Right. They can administer Narcan. They, they can have administ- it right there. That's right. They can administer the Narcan. If they deem it that you need to go to the hospital, they will take you there. Um, one of the first things that's done when that person comes in is crisis response is called. So... We have an outstanding crisis response team in this county. So they're they're called and they will either come to the fire department or they will meet that person at the hospital. Okay. To help them. And what, what does the crisis response team do? Um, again, they're an amazing team of people. Um, you know, Wes is Wes is a good friend and one of my favorite people. But Jen Corbin, who's the director of crisis response, is an amazing human being that has a passion to help people. Um, so while they they used to just really answer kind of mental health calls. They are across the span now. So you can call, you know, they take domestic violence, they take substance use, they take, you know, suicide threats. Um, and they what they do is they travel an officer who is who is qualified and has gone through some additional training mm-hmm. will go out with um, a, a licensed clinical social worker to um, to that person or to that phone call. On on safe stations, let's face it, they're they're guys in uniforms with bad guys and girls in uniforms with badges. Is that a frightening thought to somebody that is is seeking help for using an illegal drug? I mean, I know they're not cops. I mean, what is you know is that a uh, is that going to be a problem? Nope. Because um, I, so I was present at the press conference mm-hmm. yesterday, and and I was just impressed that that our county and our city officials all came together to help this problem. And, and yesterday there was you know Wes Adams, there Wes was County was there. Executive Shu, you had Mayor Panelides, you had Chief Altamara, you had Chief Graves from the Fire Department, you had Major Chief Baker. Stokes. And uh, Major Baker from the Annapolis Police Department. So you had all of the people that were involved there that were doing it. Yep. Um, yep. They were there, and and what. What will happen for those people, if you come in and you have a warrant, and the warrant, I mean, you know, they're not going to let you go if you have a warrant for murder, right? right? Right. But they want to get you the help. So they're willing to push that warrant aside to get you the help that you need. Not to say that you won't face it, but you will not immediately be put into handcuffs because that's not there. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking to get people help first. Well, they do. They need to get the uh, the deaths and the overdoses under under control. The right. the deaths it appears to be doing that way. So so it is it is truly a safe station. It is a safe haven for people to be able to come in to get the help that they want. Now, this is something that somebody, if you and I were using right here, and one of us overdosed, I could load load somebody up in the car and take them. Absolutely. I mean, it's so it's not necessarily a user that needs to go. Oh, I I need help. That well, that's correct. My 
my suggestion would be that if you're in a room and you're using and somebody overdoses, you need to call 911 because that we're dealing with, you know, we're not just dealing with heroin now because now we're dealing with fentanyl. Right. And fentanyl um, is far more powerful than heroin. And they're adding it. You know, the dealers, it's a business for them. Mm-hmm. So they're adding it because they want to make their product better. Um, but that fentanyl can kill you within, you know, three to five minutes. Yeah. Angel, if I'm out of heroin right now, I'm here in Annapolis mm-hmm. um, off of Bay Ridge Road, and I wanted to uh, send you out to, to get me a dose. How long would it take you? Not even 10 minutes. What if we were recording up in Severna Park? Not even 10 minutes. <laughs> Odenton? Maybe 12. <laughs> Harwood? 20. That's amazing. Amazing. We'll be right back. When it comes to diamonds, there are two things that matter. Reputation and value. At Zachary's, you know our reputation. We pride ourselves on providing the best experience for every customer every day. Because we wouldn't be here without you. But what you might not know is that Zachary's is the only diamond importer in Annapolis. We cut a check for half a million dollars and deal directly with the De Beers site holder to bring you the best quality diamonds. That's just one step away from a mine. So by the time a diamond gets to your hands, only two people have touched it not six. I'm Steve Samaras, and at Zachary's, we've spent decades cultivating relationships around the world to ensure we can offer the best value on a diamond. But the relationships we value most are the ones we create with our customers right here in town. Zachary's, online at Zachary'sJewelers.com. If it's a diamond, we're a good place to start. Let's bring it up a little bit. Um, Please. There is an event happening this weekend. Uh, which is fun. It happened last year, and it's called Hoops for Hope. And this is happening on Sunday at Anne Arundel County Community College at the Jenkins Gym. Yeah. Doors will open at noon. Angel is the brainchild behind this. The lead partner is Recovery Anne Arundel, and their website is recoveryannarundel.org. Essentially, it is people in recovery across the board, whether it be alcohol or drugs or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Uh, against maybe maybe the people that arrested them at one point, but it was it's against the uh, Anne Arundel County and Annapolis City. Do they get them up to, or is just Anne Arundel County? No, this this particular game is is the Anne Arundel County Police Department, and we can talk about the city and Major Baker for an event later later in the year. Okay, but um, but this is the Anne Arundel County Police Department versus recovering addicts in a basketball game at mm-hmm. Anne Arundel County Community College. What what's the event all about? How do we how do we I mean we can obviously go and we can watch but what do we do to support well to Serenity support Sisters and recovery Anne Arundel? I mean there's admission, there's stuff to buy, bake sales, there's some baked goods and Well, we have we have t-shirts. It's um so the game is $7 to get in. Mm-hmm. Um it's very family friendly. Kids 6 and under are free. The whole thought behind it was was how how do we bring the community together, truly bring them together? So the tagline that came out of that was unity in the community. And I thought, what better way to do that than to bring the police department and a group of, of people, who, you know, addicts in recovery or people that have suffered from substance use disorders, if you will, um, to bring them together to play a game a friendly game of basketball. And um, when I presented the idea to Chief Altamari, he bought in immediately and said, Miss Angel, we would be happy to play. And uh, so then I went to Mike Goldfadden over at the Samaritan House because I knew that they that they had a cohesive team of guys that played basketball together. Mm -hmm. And I approached Mike and I said, how do you feel about this? And he said, well, I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's a good idea. I'm like, it's a great (laughs) idea, Mike, let's just do it. Um, And he presented it to that team and they were all on board. So last year was our first, Um, it is now an annual event for us. And I can tell you, you know, we all thought, eh, maybe we'll get 50 or a hundred people there. 350 attendees right. last year and it was a great game it was a game that went into double overtime the end score was 54 to 50 who won recovery took the trophy <laughs> however my personal opinion is that while they may have won the game that everybody in that room was a winner that day because they truly came together and brought some unity to the community and and we need that unity to start well, it's sort, of, it's sort of a, an analogy into the whole recovery process that the big goal is to rein 
you know, re-infiltrate yourself into, that's not the right word, but in, into the community, into yeah, it's a word. society. Um, that's not the appropriate word for what I'm, what I'm thinking I'm of. I'm trying to but, dig you out of this. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it really does. I mean, now it's bringing, you know, and, and I jokingly said, yeah, and the guys had probably arrested them. But, I mean, this is turning around and saying, okay, well, we've now moved on. We are recovering. We are, you know, coming into this. The police are sitting there saying, well, yeah, you were, you know, you were a badass. And, you know, we threw you in the back of a car at one point. Good on you. Let's let let's do it. I know uh, when T.J. Smith was with the county police department, I mean, he had a great story about some kid that came up to him and said, you know, you just absolutely chewed me out and and yelled at me and and sent me on my way when you could have arrested me. Mm -hmm. And that was all it took. And thank you. And I'm like, wow, that was, you know, so it's really cool when you see this come together on this. And I'm I'm thinking that this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the event with the uh, Hoops for Hope on Sunday is not necessarily about raising money, um, the awareness. But I mean, obviously the money always helps. Well, it <laughs> does. It does. So we, my goal with Recovery Anne Arundel is to raise that awareness in the community to help reduce stigma, show that we really do, we really can come together and work together to um, to overcome the issues that we have. Uh, and we do raise some money. So the money that we raise for this particular event, half of it this year will go to the Circuit Court Drug Court Alumni Association. Okay. And what they do is they will buy literature for some people that are in drug court. So these people are graduates, the alumni. Right. Um, and they want to help the people that are coming through drug court. So half of the money will go to them to help their cause. And the other half will go to the Collegiate Recovery Center at Anne Arundel Community College. Because there are a ton of people in recovery who all of a sudden decide they want to become good students and they want to go to school. College is not always... Uh, the most... It can be a hostile place for somebody I, I, in recovery. I see that. I see that. Um, so the CRC is a safe haven um, right at the community college. And... Several years ago, um, working for the coordinator for the substance abuse education piece at the community college, Loretta Lawson Muncy, you know, she she approached me and said, hey, do you think that this is a good idea? And I said, yes. So the other half of the money goes to help support that cause okay. at the college. Um, and, and we've talked, mentioned West Adams a number of times and, and drug court. I'm not going to go back and listen to that episode. We'll put a link in, into the show notes as well. But Wes talked about drug court in his episode as well there. I will say this, too. And you and I have been accused of... I'm not accused, but I mean that we can be kind of pessimistic, and I think the pro- a big part of that is doing a show like this. It's easy to pick out the things that are wrong, and it's easy to to, to, to because those are the issues that people care about, whether it be Crystal Spring or um, any, any issue where people are all fired up. You know, it's hard to do a good news, good news show. But I will say this: as cynical as I am, I am very appreciative of the fact that that the county, the city, Wes, you, that I think we've handled this crisis as a community uh, exceptionally well. You know, and I really think that it's a scourge. People are being affected. People are dying. Well, it moves um, on to the state level, too. I mean, Governor Hogan's been a, a pretty big. I, but mean, and, I and, will say that. Absolutely. And Hogan can do more. And Shu can do more. <laughs> and but mean, as critical as we can be of government, I, I really will take my hat off and say that, that our local and state governments have really stepped up. Uh, and, and as well as the volunteer organizations that have mm-hmm. jumped in. So as bad as this is. I think that it is being being addressed well, in, in a, in a constructive way. Look at the way. numbers and the increase right. that it's seen over the years, and how I mean, heroin sort of came in, in as like a tsunami, <clears throat> if you will. The waves were lapping at the shore, and all of a sudden, this big ass wave comes through. And to everybody's credit, they they recognize this and they said, "Damn, we need we need to do something." And we are doing a little bit of catch up, a um, little bit for sure. And it's it's a long road ahead of us. Mm-hmm. to get it under control because it is still there. The map just blows my mind that there's that many overdoses and that many deaths. Another thing that we've also mentioned is Samaritan House a couple of times throughout this thing. And that is sort of your male counterpart, even though you are male and female. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are a similar program for men in recovery. Correct. And they have been, uh, they're sort of like the hidden... I don't want to say hidden gem of Annapolis, but they've been sort of a hidden under the radar thing until the last three or four years. Uh, nobody knew they existed back in the woods. It was just like right. this little, you know, it's, it's, that's where the men go and back in the woods. And where is you know, it? we never hear it. See? Yeah, I, I don't ex- know. Ex- exactly what I'm told. It's back off of. Oh, behind the, it's behind the Safeway on, yeah. on oh, Forest Drive yeah. back there. I had no idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it's been there a long time. Near the wellness house? Well, no. It, no, down um, by water and then over, but it's back toward the wellness house side. I had no idea. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's been there. Been there forever. I'm, I'm like 40 years. Yes. So I mean, I mean, major, major times. Mm-hmm. But uh, they do a very similar program as to you. And while you are doing the Hoops for Hope on Sunday, the Samaritan House on Wednesday, mm-hmm. May 3rd. We'll be having their burritos for beds, and that is their fundraiser. And this is fun. I was there, I was there last year. This is I think the fourth time that they're doing I it. Love burritos. It's at uh, it's at Chevy's and Chevy's Fresh Mex right there on uh, Route Four. Two. They donate the burritos with eggs and bacon and sausage and all that kind of stuff in there. And oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the computer. Alpha Engineering comes out and they line the bars with uh, laptops and terminals. And you can actually make a donation, a cash donation right there. Uh, they've got the ability. You don't need to. And enjoy. You, know, you pay a little thing and you can write a check. You can make a donation through your credit card and enjoy a nice breakfast with Chevy's, which donates it. Mm-hmm. And it goes from 7 to 10 a.m. There's no reservations. You just show up there. Burritos for beds. And that's going to go a long way to help the problems that we have here in Anne Arundel County, as well as in the state of Maryland, as will helping to support Hoops for Hope on Sunday at Anne Arundel County Community College at noon. What's on your mind? Last last minute things here, you throw it out there. and Well, um, again, I, I run the gamut prevention, treatment, and recovery. And, um, you know, one of the things that that we strive for in all of this work that we do in the county is no new users. Um, And we need, you know, we need the community for that. So one of the other hats, because I wear 23 of them, but one of the other hats that I've recently taken on is prevention, a prevention coalition in Annapolis. Um, It is ASAP. So it's Annapolis Substance Abuse Prevention. Um, Our county is, we are, we are doing a lot of work. I mean, we have four prevention coalitions in Anne Arundel County. There are some jurisdictions that don't have any. Right. Um, And to get information on that, you can go to um, preventsubstanceabuse.org and you can find me on there for ASAP. And that's that's important. Um, And again, we need community members because the talking heads that you've spoken about, we can sit around and talk about stuff all day long, but we need to know what the community needs. We need to know what they want. So um, that's a great way for the community to get involved. Um, You know, everybody likes donations. So you can donate. There's a Donate Now button there. You know, there's a Donate Now button on recoveryannarundle.org. You know, you can do that for any of the organizations. Right. So you've got SamaritanHouseAnnapolis.org. You've got PreventSubstanceAbuse.org. You've got SerenitySistas.com. S-I-S-T-A-S.com. And, and you've got uh, RecoveryAnnArundel.org as well. And they're all equally worthy just doing great work for um, pretty much for our community because we really do need to find a way to bring it back together. Yep. It's a community issue and it's going to take the community to, to pull together with all the efforts. Angel, I want to thank you very much for this is you. great and, and the work coming. Uh, you've thank opened you. up an awful lot of eyes. Uh, certainly, mine are open a little bit more, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on Sunday at Hoops for Hope. All right, it's going to be a great game. Come out and support it. Who's going to win it? Not going there. Everybody's a winner. Oh, everybody! Oh, you know, everybody gets a medal. <laughs> Who's going to win the basketball game? I don't, I'm, I'm not. I, you know, I've been told recently to um, to talk some smack to Ryan Frazier, and I brought that to Ryan's attention. I said, Ryan, I'm not doing that, and he said, We're going to win. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. All right, I'll put it here now, man. The cops are going down. <laughs> Nice. We'll see. In the meantime, you can find us on Facebook at Maryland Crabs. We have a page and we have a group. And you can find us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast. You can find John at I in Annapolis. I'm at Tim Hamilton 47. You can friend us on Facebook because we're a friendly type. Send us an email at info at themarylandcrabs.com. Uh, our website is themarylandcrabs.com. Subscribe on iTunes, on Google Play. You can find us on Stitcher and now on Facebook because John did some work. And Alexa, we're, we're everywhere now. So give us the reviews and the stars because we love those and we're very needy. If you have an idea for a show or you're a candidate working running for office, we'd love to have you on. So reach out to us. And Angel, thank Thank you so much for coming in. You guys do kick-ass work, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's always my pleasure. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home.
go.